All right. So good morning, everyone. Um, I will have to do a confession. Um, so this week at the OpenStack Summit Berlin, there were like 27 talks about edge compute. I actually counted them. And more than 30 on Kubernetes. So I tried to basically attract as much audience as I could by combining all the hot topics of the week. Um, unfortunately, I didn't manage to get a full room. Uh, I'm hoping that it's because this is the last day of the summit. It's pretty early, 9 a.m. Anyway, thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, my name is Mark Rapoport. I'm a product manager uh, in the control business unit in Juniper. But this morning, I'm here to represent the Tungsten Fabric community. Um, and we are going to talk about how to combine OpenStack, Kubernetes, and Tungsten Fabric to build an edge compute uh, stack. Uh, very briefly, um, who, are, uh, who is familiar with uh, Tungsten Fabric? Okay, I would say one third, maybe one fourth of the audience. How about maybe Contrail or Open Contrail? Oh, okay, I see that we still have some kind of branding recognition issue with Tungsten Fabric. Basically, Tungsten Fabric is a new name for Open Contrail. So let me give you a bit of history on. Um, what used to be Contrail, I mean, Open Contrail, that is now Tungsten Fabric. Um, it's basically an SDN solution. Uh, and the objective is to provide a connectivity and security for any workload in any kind of environment, whether we are talking about a private cloud based on OpenStack, obviously, but also public cloud, whether it's a Google, uh, AWS, or Azure. Um, it's not limited to IaaS environment. It provides the same uh, set of connectivity and security services for containerized workloads, uh, especially orchestrated through Kubernetes. And last but not least, um, Tanks and Fabric was recently extended also to cover uh, bare metal uh, workload management. Um, as you can see, it's already a pretty uh, mature product um, since it started five years ago. I, I would argue it's the most feature-rich commercial SDN solution today on the market that is based on an open source project. Uh, back in the days, it started in 2013 as a startup called Contrail, which was acquired by Juniper. And when Juniper acquired Contrail, uh, at the time, they decided to open source it. And that was the beginning of Open Contrail. Um, the original version was focused on the uh, telco cloud NFV use case, uh, with a specific focus on how to integrate inside a telco uh, environment, leveraging all the standard BGP, MPLS VPN framework, um, and uh, also building key capabilities like service chaining. So over time, the product was enhanced to uh, cater with uh, different orchestrators, like VMware, um, uh, adding support for Kubernetes, obviously. Uh, and uh, this year, with the version 5 of the product, the scope was significantly enhanced to not only cover networking and connectivity, but also expand to providing an integrated layer of security and move beyond private data center to expand towards uh, public cloud, like uh, the three uh, main uh, public cloud players I just mentioned earlier but also going beyond the pure software uh, network virtualization layer by integrating also with the physical underlay layer and providing the management of your data center fabric to natively extend the same set of services for bare metal servers. 
And last year, when uh, we decided to join the Linux Foundation, that's when Open Control was renamed Tanks and Fabric. Hopefully, that clarifies uh, for good the naming of the different uh, projects. And so now there are multiple products actually based on Tanks and Fabric. The main one, I mean, being a Juniper employee, is obviously Contrail. But there are two other companies who recently launched. Um, their own commercial product based on Tankstand Fabric. So we are currently hosted inside the LF uh, networking uh, next to a number of other uh, open source SDN solutions like Open Daylight or Onos or data plane um, uh, projects like OVS or Fido. What is unique about Tankstand Fabric is that it's the only SDN solution that combines both the control plane and the data plane, uh, since Tankstand Fabric includes a component called vRouter, and I'll go through it uh, very quickly. Another thing to note is that um, we uh, heavily contribute to a number of other projects that are also hosted inside the Linux Foundation Networking Group. Uh, we are a member of Ecrano, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this. We are contributing a lot to DPDK, and we are also active members in ONAP and OPNAV. So very briefly, um, as I mentioned earlier, on one side we have the vRouter component, which is a data plane, which provides all the forwarding and security enforcement for the various workloads, whether these are virtual machines, containers, bare metal servers, or also potentially the same VMs or, or containers running in public cloud. Thanks and Fabric controller, control plane itself includes a number of components, config, control analytics. I'll quickly go through them. And once you have this uh, abstraction layer uh, that is up and running, you can deliver a number of services across all these workloads. Uh, obviously, the basic building block, which is layer two and layer three connectivity through uh, EVPN and IPVPN uh, fabric, um, but also all the entire IPAM, IP addressing, DNS assignment of your workloads, uh, QoS, security, load balancing, um, service chaining, all uh, fully distributed on the vRouter. Uh, there is obviously an analytics engine that is part of the solution that provides a visibility on every flow that is managed by Tungsten Fabric. And uh, there are obviously uh, multiple ways to consume the product, APIs or, or UI. And in the case of UI, oh, sorry, of API, which is typically the main way to consume the product, that's the way all the orchestrators, whether it's obviously OpenStack or Kubernetes, ONAP, uh, so on and so forth. These are, uh, this is the main way to consume Tankstand Fabric. So very briefly, the architecture of the product. I mentioned earlier that we have this uh, centralized control plane, which is using actually BGP between the different control instances to provide HA and scaling. Um, the control plane manages and programs the vRouter, vRouter that runs inside the server through XMPP. And it also orchestrates and configures your physical environment using a mix of all the standard networking protocols, BGP, MPLS, uh, NetConf, EVPN, VXLAN, whether we are talking about the data center gateway or your top of rack switch. And what it provides is an abstraction layer where all your different workloads which are connected here, whether they're located on one server, the other server, whether they are behind the top of rack switch, on the left in the case of bare metal servers, um, you attach these workloads to virtual networks and all the blue ones, virtual machines or bare metal servers that are part of the same Blue VN are, are natively connected between themselves. Same for the red ones. And then you can define routing policies on how these virtual networks are connected between themselves. And you can also define, let's say, service chaining, saying, I want all the traffic uh, 
uh, between the workloads that are part of the blue VN on the left to go through a specific firewall instance uh, when they want to uh, reach workloads that are connected to the red uh, VN on the right. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are two main ways to consume the product. Obviously, there is a UI, but in a large production environment, typically the way to consume the product is through uh, the standard APIs, whether these are the uh, Neutron or um, Heat APIs in the case of OpenStack environment, or using uh, some of the native REST APIs of Tanks and Fabric. Uh, Tankstand Fabric has a pretty rich community of contributors. So we have a healthy mix of, I would say, one third of vendors, uh, networking players, all the main OpenStack distribution companies obviously are here, Red Hat, Canonical, Mirantis. Uh, um, then there is another third of uh, committee members uh, which are mainly system integrators, uh, software companies that build solution uh, around tanks and fabric or integrate it as part of a larger ecosystem or global solution. And the last third of the members are uh, actual users. Um, a lot of telco, uh, as you can see, but not just telco, there are also a number of enterprise gaming companies uh, and some of these users are actual contributors who are providing and uh, pushing code to the project. So if you want to have a quick feeling of the product, you can go to tanks10.io slash start, where you can deploy a sandbox in AWS of a tanks and fabric cluster that is going to be orchestrated through Kubernetes. Um, now, that just to obviously get a quick feeling, it's not meant to be used for any kind of uh, real-life uh, environment. Um, having said that, we also have what we call a standalone Ansible-based deployer to uh, deploy tanks and fabric. But uh, typically, the way users deploy the product is through the... Um, installers, we have done uh, heavy work to be fully integrated with all the main uh, lifecycle manager tools of the orchestration. Helm, where at and talked a lot about it uh, during the last couple of days. Uh, they are investing heavily around uh, Helm, um, Airship, and all these set of tools uh, that generate common lifecycle management layer. Cola and Sybil is another one. We've done extensive work to be fully integrated in terms of life cycle with uh, O, which is the upstream life cycle manager of uh, Red Hat OpenStack Director, uh, but also obviously Canonical and Mirantis. So you can really pick whichever um, deployer solution you want based on what kind of orchestration you want to use alongside uh, Tanks and Fabric. Okay, um, as this talk is about edge compute, I just want to briefly mention that we recently joined the Ukraino project that is part of the LFN. Uh, that is the original blueprint that was published by at and uh, one of the key founders of Ukraino, uh, where as you can see at the network control and data plane layers, there were a number of components that were considered to be uh, in this blueprint. With Tankstand Fabric, our ambition is to provide all these capabilities uh, combined inside Tankstand Fabric, whether it's about uh, providing kernel-based forwarding, DPDK, SROV, SmartNIC, which is not mentioned here, but which is also supported uh, by Tankstand Fabric. There is actually a very active group of SmartNIC vendors uh, that are contributing to build a common set of offload APIs that can be shared across the um, SmartNIC vendors to basically accelerate the router data plane. 
And here are a few more pointers on how to get more information on Tungsten Fabric if you want to get involved. Okay, so let's talk about edge compute now. I'm not going to spend too much time on the requirements and use cases. There were a lot of presentation on uh, this topic this week. Uh, I'm just here reusing the framework that was built by Acrano to identify the different use cases for uh, edge compute. And just to mention that right now, Tangsten Fabric, in the context of edge computing, is focusing heavily on the, I would say, telco network edge, uh, not necessarily on the IoT or, or UCP use case. This is more the, the focus, I would say, right now in the short term on how to leverage this combination of OpenStack, Kubernetes, and Tangsten Fabric for an edge compute deployment. Uh, so keeping in mind this use case, what are the key requirements for edge compute? Uh, basically, the first one is having a centralized control plane. Why? Because in these remote locations where you don't have much resource, you cannot afford to deploy uh, a full-blown control stack in each and every small location. Uh, not only that, but that will also create a huge amount of control plane to manage if you have, let's say, thousands of tens of thousands of COs or base stations. Uh, if each of one has a full-blown control uh, instance, you can imagine the pain uh, it would create to manage them. Um, another key requirement in edge compute is being able to support containerized workload. Yes, NFV started heavily on uh, virtual machines and virtualization. But now uh, we see that more and more um, VNFs are being containerized. And a good reason to use that in the context of edge compute is that typically a container has a smaller footprint than a full-blown virtual machine. Third requirement, always in the same context of how do I deal with the fact that I have very limited resource is how to have um, a data plane, which in the case of Tank Tank Fabric is vRouter, how to have a data plane which has a small footprint in terms of CPU and memory requirement. Fourth one is multi-tenancy, uh, which is speci specially needed in the context of 5G for things like network slicing, how you can uh, leverage the same physical infrastructure partition it into multiple virtual instances that are dedicated to a set of different uh, internal or external customers, whether we are talking about MVNO in the context of 5G or other types of, let's say, enterprise customers, enterprise VPN, for example. And last but not least, security, which is a very strong requirement, even more than, let's say, regular, typical existing NFV. Um, because when we are talking about distribution, in the case of edge compute, we are talking about small sites which do not necessarily have a lot of physical security. Um, they can be easily or much more easily accessed than a large centralized data center. And also another key difference for the security is that in some cases, um, the service provider that is deploying the service might not own the entire access network. They might need to uh, lease capacity from some local, let's say, small cells provider. And so as they are not using their own network, they need to encrypt the traffic to protect it. All right, so let's talk about the first requirement, centralized control, and how we solve this requirement with Tungsten Fabric. So the uh, main concept is basically to centralize all your control functions, obviously all the compute orchestration, whether it's OpenStack for VMs or Kubernetes for uh, containers, and also all the control functions of Tungsten Fabric itself in your large regional data center, and then what you distribute and deploy in your remote COs uh, 
is just all the uh, data plane related functions. Now, how does that work in practice? So bear with me, this is a bit of a busy slide here. As I mentioned earlier, what you have on the top right is uh, inside your large regional data center, you have all your control cluster, um, typically a, a cluster of three instances for HA uh, and scaling. Um, in the case of Tangsten Fabric, you have this configuration control and analytics cluster that uh, manages both the local data center gateways um, using BGP peering that you see on, on the upper right and XMPP protocol that I mentioned earlier that is used between Tangsten Fabric control plane and the vRouter data plane. What is new in this diagram that you don't see in a regular, let's say, uh, data center only environment is you have a number of extra instances of control plane, which, is our, which are the control pop one, two, and three at the top. Basically, you have a number of virtual machines that you deploy in your large centralized regional data center that are used to manage all the routing uh, and security control information for all these POPs. They do it centrally, again, by building the same BGP sessions to the remote uh, gateways that are deployed in the small POPs and XMPP sessions towards the vRouter of the small compute nodes which are uh, deployed remotely. And one of the... Um, key value of this model is to allow really optimized routing where you don't have to send traffic between, let's say, two workloads between, uh, let's say, in this example, the container that runs inside POP1 needs to send traffic to the virtual machine that runs inside POP2. Traffic is not going to go back and forth from POP1 to your original cent data center and then back to POP2. Um, since you have a full awareness of the routing topology of your MPLS VPN network, you can optimize the traffic flow to go directly from uh, one local um, site to the closest local site. Now let's talk about how do we manage containerized workloads in uh, Tungsten Fabric. So first of all, there are two main touch points between Kubernetes and Tungsten Fabric. On the control plane side, we have the Cube Manager, which basically listens to um, the Kubernetes API servers for all the new events uh, of pod being deployed in a specific, uh, on a specific compute nodes, let's say. And on the um, data plane side, the integration point with the kubelet that runs in each compute node is through the standard CNI plugin. And then the vRouter replaces the kube proxy. So these are the basic building blocks of the integration of Tangsten Fabric in Kubernetes. And then, each object that is specified in Kubernetes is mapped to an equivalent. Uh, namespace maps to a project. A pod maps to a VM in the context of Tangsten Fabric. Service will map to an ECMP load balancer. And I'll go into a bit more detail both for service and ingress. Ingress, which is a layer 7 load balancer, contrary to service, which is a layer 4 load balancer. Ingress maps to um, an HA proxy instance. And the Kubernetes network policy is mapped to a security policy in Tanks and Fabric. Uh, so just a quick clarification on, for the people who are not fully familiar with the Kubernetes terminology, the difference between service and ingress. So service in Kubernetes is an abstraction to group uh, a, a logical set of pods that deliver a service. Basically, they are all used to provide uh, HA and, and scaling. 
and uh, what Tangsten Fabric provides in the context of a service construct, it implements it by doing um, layer four based load balancing uh, natively on the VRR. So this is fully distributed. You don't need to send the traffic to some uh, centralized processing point. Uh, on the other hand, ingress is typically an object that is uh, visible externally uh, and that is used to do more granular type of load balancing all the way to layer 7. For example, to do URL-based load balancing, sending uh, one part of a... Sorry. One part of a website to another service, another part to a, a different service. And the way Tungsten Fabric implements an ingress object is by spawning by default an HE proxy instance, which will do this uh, layer 7 load balancing. Having said that, it, this is fully uh, configurable, and you can use the load balancer of your preference, uh, IV load balancer, or whichever other mainstream load balancer of the market can be used for to, to basically implement ingress. Okay, this is a bit of a busy slide. <clears throat> uh, there are two main models to uh, have coexistence of virtual machines and container, basically OpenStack and Kubernetes inside the same environment. So the first model that is described here um, is a, let's say, model, a side-by-side -side model where you have your um, virtualized machines which are uh, deployed by OpenStack, and you are running Kubernetes directly on top of bare metal. And so what you see here, uh, you have your OpenStack domain uh, that runs on one side all the control components, OpenStack, Tanks and Fabric, and on each compute, you have your, your vRouter, um, KVM, that. Uh, that provide the uh, virtualization layer for your VMs. Uh, and then Nova Agent basically talks to VRR Agent, which, gen which then uh, programs VRR to implement all the forwarding and security policies. On the other hand, you have your Kubernetes uh, master cluster and um, the Kube Manager that listens to the API server. And in terms of running your actual pods, same thing, you have vRouter. Um, here you see that the pods are directly connected to vRouter since they are running directly on top of bare metal. And inside each compute, the minions, you have your kubelet that talks to the CNI plugin, uh, which itself programs vRouter through vRouter agent. Uh, now what we often see is the need to run Kubernetes not just on bare metal, but uh, inside virtual machine. And that's what's called the nested mode. Um, and that brings another layer of complexity, because by default, what you would need would be two different layers of SDN, which would also create two layers of encapsulation, where the traffic that would exit from a pod would go through a first tunneling um, to get out of the VM, and then when it would reach the router uh, that runs directly at the host Linux operating system, would get another layer of encapsulation. So not only would you have to manage like two separate planes of encapsulation, but also two layers of tunneling. So the way we solve this challenge in tungsten fabric in the nested mode is basically um, when your pods are running inside a virtual machines, what we are doing is just instantiating a VLAN ID to separate the traffic that comes from different pods inside the virtual machine. Uh, and that's only after that when the traffic reaches the router that we apply the regular layer of um, lookup tunneling and forwarding outside of your compute server. And that's 
how you can have coexistence of virtual machines and pods running inside other virtual machines uh, on the same compute server. That's a pretty busy slide. I think I'm going to have to work on simplifying it at some point. OK, um, one just quick uh, comment on service chaining. Service chaining is a key requirement in NFV. Um, and there are uh, many different scenarios that you typically have to deal with. Have a chain of multiple VNFs um, that you need to steer the traffic through between your different virtual network. You typically also need to be much more granular and say, I want to send all the traffic between these two VNs, red and green, uh, through the same set of service, but say, I want my HTTP traffic to go through some kind of uh, HTTP proxy optimization, and the rest of the traffic to go through another service chain. The reality is you don't have one uh, virtual machine that provides your VNF service, you're going to have a pool of VNFs that are grouped to provide logical scale out. Uh, and so you need to be able to load balance uh, across this pool of instances. Um, and the new challenge that the containerization of VNF brings is how to provide service chaining for containers. And here, uh, the issue is that Kubernetes itself doesn't have a construct to identify interfaces. Um, by default, a pod is single attach. And service chaining typically requires at least two interfaces, two logical interfaces, to identify the traffic that comes from your uh, left virtual network and that needs to be sent to your right virtual network. So what we did was extending uh, Kubernetes capabilities using uh, CRD to be able to support more than one uh, logical interface on a pod, which will then allow us to reuse and leverage all the service chaining capabilities that were already available inside the product for a virtual machine and being able to extend them to containerized uh, or pod types of network functions. Okay, next requirement, uh, the need to have a smaller footprint of the router. <clears throat> so originally when Tangsend Fabric was designed, it was meant to be deployed in large scale data centers with potentially hundreds, thousands of compute nodes, if not more, um, in service provider environments where you would have uh, tens of thousands of virtual networks, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of uh, IP prefixes. And that's why the focus being on scalability, obviously VRouter by default has a fairly big footprint in terms of CPU on memory. Uh, on memory. It's expected to, to be deployed on a high-end uh, server, like typically 16 to 20 cores, dual socket, with a lot of memory. And VR itself can easily use 4 gig of memory, can potentially use up to 8 cores if you try to get the highest possible forwarding performance using DPDK, where you have to uh, fully dedicate your cores, which are going to be used 100% CPU uh, for vRouter DPDK processing. So the need was to, uh, and we are just at the beginning of this journey, to put vRouter on a diet to deal with these environments where instead of having these super beefy Intel servers, uh, you have these much smaller uh, compute servers in edge compute environment. And so the first step is to decrease the amount of memory and CPU uh, needed. And in the future, what we will also work on is supporting not just x86, but also ARM CPUs, which are much more common on these smaller platforms that are used in edge compute environments. Okay, multi-tenancy, very briefly. Um, 
what we did in tungsten fabric was extending the um, connectivity and isolation model way beyond what default Kubernetes provides, which is basically um, the default model is that any part can communicate with any other part. It, it's, the point was to provide connectivity to developers and not having to deal with any kind of security or isolation. So the first simple isolation mode that is available with uh, Tangsten Fabric is a namespace isolation, which basically does uh, how it's named. Uh, isolating all the pods um, that are from different namespaces, and, but inside one spaces, all the pods can communicate together. And that's probably the most common scenario deployment, but we can go beyond that and even uh, isolate different parts of the same namespace, and there are some specific scenario for that. Uh, let's say the equivalent of what is a micro-segmentation scenario where you want each and every single individual workload to be by default isolated from all the rest of the world if you have very stringent uh, security requirements. Um, <clears throat> As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, all the um, infrastructure of Tencent Fabric is based on the um, uh, IP, BGP, MPLS, VPN framework. So the way traffic of different tenants is isolated is by leveraging typical uh, VRF uh, type of behavior where each tenant is connected to a separate um, routing and forwarding uh, table, whether it's a virtual machine or a, um, a pod, um, that's the way each tenant is basically isolated and how you can provide some kind of network slicing behavior. <coughs> okay, let me cover the last requirements as we see for this uh, edge compute uh, use case, which is security. So one requirement related with security is basically the capability to define in a very concise way your security policies and being able to apply them across multiple uh, orchestration environments. Let's say you define a set of uh, security rules in OpenStack environment that would be security groups that uh, are uh, defined across the different virtual networks and then being able to reapply the exact set of security uh, filters across your different environment. Um, and that's what Tangsten Fabric provides with an, um, a poly an abstracted policy uh, construct where you can define your, your domains, uh, the type of deployment, the geographic location, um, you can use abstract uh, tags, labels, uh, that could be, for example, very useful in the context of a uh, 5G network where you have all the three GPP interfaces. For people who are familiar with the mobile world, there are a gazillion number of interfaces to deal with. Uh, GI, uh, S1, X1. You can easily tag all these interfaces with these specific names, and then by default, all the endpoints that, have, that share the same tag will be connected between themselves, and they are going to be isolated from all the other endpoints. Um, and that's just the way the network policies in, in the case of a Kubernetes environment, are being translated as firewall policies on Tangsten Fabric. So uh, um, Kubernetes label becomes a tag. Um, same for namespace, a network policy maps to a firewall policy. Um, I already mentioned about ingress and service, how uh, these are uh, basically mapped in terms of Tangsten Fabric construct. And last but not least, uh, 
um, the need to encrypt your traffic. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in the case of edge compute, you have to deal with higher uh, security issues, the fact that you are deploying your compute nodes on sites that can be potentially uh, owned by a third party that is not managed by the service provider, or you might have to use some least capacity. 5G itself comes with some uh, new security requirement, and that's where being able to natively encrypt the traffic between your endpoints, which is what Tanks and Fabric provides, where you can define very granular policies to say, I want to encrypt traffic between these two workloads. All of this is impl implemented natively inside vRouter. And it also comes with uh, a visual visualization engine, which allows you to basically uh, see in real time what is the flow metrics between your different endpoints. Uh, obviously, the first layer of aggregation is the virtual networks. You see the traffic matrix between the different, different virtual networks. And for each virtual network, what are the endpoints that are sending and receiving traffic uh, allowed between themselves? And just a quick uh, pointer if you want more information on the project, the code, um, how to participate. Um, so hopefully uh, you've seen that we already have today a pretty solid base to leverage tanks and fabric to deploy an edge compute use case, and we'll keep adding more and more capabilities over time as we identify uh, more use cases. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Real quickly, if, um, if you're interested in spinning up a quick environment, tungsten fabric and working with it, and you have your AWS credentials, you can go to tungsten.io slash start and uh, get the carbide, we call it carbide, evaluation yep. environment. And you just log in with your AWS credentials and in about 12, 15 minutes, you can spin up a basic tungsten fabric environment and start playing with it. I've got some cards here with that information. I'll leave them up front. Not the one. Hello, uh, I have a question regarding the constraints on the network between your uh, central data center and the data center or the, the places where you run your pods, uh, because in terms of edge computing, uh, we can have uh, constraints uh, on that. Uh, and in my case, in the banking area, uh, we have uh, countries uh, that are uh, unreliable in terms of network, or uh, we have oversea location very far from uh, uh, Western Europe, for example. Right. Um, so if I understood correctly your question, it's about what are the constraints in terms of latency between your control plane and VRR data plane. What we typically recommend is a 50 millisecond uh, round trip time. Um, and that's relatively aligned with the constraint you would have also on the compute side with, let's say, OpenStack itself between uh, your Nova Compute, your Nova Agent, and other components between your centralized control plane and what's running in the local um, remote compute node. That's typically enough to cover scenarios where your edge uh, compute nodes are in the same geographical region, whatever it means in terms of tens, hundreds of kilometers. Not clearly thousands of kilometers, but that's just giving you uh, a rough idea of what is uh, possible to do in this context. Hello. Um, about um, security and um, the tags and so on, this is also open sourced? or? So all the security and, and tags part, uh, and I think I, I understand where this question is coming from. Yes, that's part of the um, Tanks and Fabric product. Um, what is followed in Tanks and Fabric is uh, 
uh, what is called the open core model. Um, all the key building blocks and infrastructure components are part of the tanks and fabric project. Uh, in the case of Juniper, what the commercial control product provides on top is um, a new UI that allows you to um, define your security policy in a more, um, I would say, user-friendly fashion. But all of this can be implemented in Tanks and Fabric using a, the API calls. Okay. Um, <coughs> for uh, the small compute, you show those figures. Um, is, is it possible? I, do you have a roadmap to go to virtual CPEs with the vRouter? So use it as uh, an SD-WAN solution? To use that, sorry? Could, could you repeat SD the question? SD-WAN solution. Because SD1. You, have, you, um, you have IPsec uh, now. Yes, like running vRouter on a UCP type of platform. Yes, that's definitely part of the plan. It's not available as of today, but that's part of the plan. Okay. I would say probably something for next year. And then last um, on um, uh, Arista and uh, Cumulus networks, they speak with eVPN or is it still OS, OVSDB? Um, so we, we started with OVSDB to basically integrate uh, data center fabric. We are now moving away from this model. That's something that was done two, three years ago. Um, now we move to an uh, EVPN VXLAN model, which is becoming the de facto standard to program a, a DC fabric. And that's what can be used for third-party uh, networking switches. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Thank you very much.